The universe has good news for the lost, lonely, and heartsick. Sugar is here, the both of us, speaking straight into your ears. I'm Cheryl Strayed. I'm Steve Almond. This is Dear Sugar Radio. Hi, Cheryl. Hi, Steve. How are you? I'm doing great. I'm doing great. I'm very excited about this episode. It's, I think this one's going to be a little controversial. You think so? Well, we're talking about age differences in relationships. Indeed. And I think people get very worked up about, well, what constitutes something that needs to even be discussed in right. terms of an age difference. Right. And people of course, read into those age differences, all kinds of things, psychological things, like do you have daddy issues if you are attracted to older men or in a relationship with an older man, or the reverse, if you if you find yourself dating or married to somebody who's much younger. I think it pushes a lot of buttons because people feel defensive right. about their own relationships or their own life choices. Right, and I think the May-December relationship, that's the little dumb cultural tag we put on these, it's an older man, powerful, successful, da da da, who's magnetic, and a younger woman who's sort of taken under his wing. We, we have a whole narrative that's already sort of in the culture's neural pathways. And then we have the backlash to that, that sense of, well, wait a second here, there's already a disparity of power. And this sort of just codifies, as you said, this idea of, well, did you really want a partner or are you looking for a dad? Right. Or a trophy wife, a sort right. of sex, a, a young sex kitten, it, such as the sort that right. my my husband Brian, I'm pretty sure that's what he was looking for, <laughs> in me. He I is, was going to say he's such a sex kitten. I totally <laughs> see that. He's seven and a half years older than me, but you know, I met him when I was 27, and he was 34, and I remember at that time I had just reached the age where dating a man who was seven years older than me was not that big of a deal. You know, I think one thing to remember when we're talking about age differences, it's, you know, there's a difference between being 20 and dating a 27-year-old and being 27 and dating a 34-year-old. You know, that I had reached a point of emotional maturity that was really, frankly, on par with Brian. And, and this isn't any criticism of Brian, but I think that a lot of men maybe take a little longer to emotionally mature to, right. to reach that point. Were they ready to be in a committed relationship? Again, not. This is not true categorically. Right. But I felt like we both met each other at the right moment in our lives. And those seven years between us, it's never come up. The only way it's ever come up is every once in a while, he'll remember a song that was popular when he was, you know, the, you know, his youngest memory of like the hit songs. And, and I'll say, oh, no, I don't know that song. Right. Or he remembers certain uh, big events in the news yeah. and so but those are things that don't really impact our relationship right what's the age difference between you and Aaron she will constantly say we're eight years apart and I'll say no we're seven and a half and then we like <laughs> argue about months and weeks my feeling when we first met I was 34 and she was 26 or 7 but I did have a kind of reverse anxiety which is I don't want to be with somebody where I have too much of the power in the relationship. I do want a partner. I, and I worried actively and continue to worry that I deprived her of a certain kind of, in her case, because she's a writer, a literary apprenticeship that she needed to go through and that I had the opportunity to go through. And instead, you know, we started a family just as she was finishing up her graduate program and moving into those years that mm -hmm. she would have been able to be fully devoted to her work. It wasn't huge different life phases, but she, by marrying me at the age that she did, she did miss out. Yeah, that's interesting. Brian and I got married when I was 30. Yeah, I don't feel like I missed out on anything in that regard. You know, I, I feel like we would both had the opportunity right. to do a whole bunch of things before we came together. You know, I think that sometimes, you know, what we're going to really talk about today are these age gaps that are more significant. And, and we're going to consider it, too, not just in heterosexual relationships. I think that you're wise in pointing out this dynamic that is about the older man 
who desires the younger woman for sometimes right. reasons that certainly I, as a feminist, kind of question. Yeah. But one of the letters we're going to talk about today is a lesbian couple. So this isn't going to just be a conversation, an old-fashioned conversation about right. what we think about when we think about May-December romances. I like that. So should we get to the first letter? Let's do it. Dear Sugar, I'm a 25-year-old single woman nearly done with graduate school. I'm on the search for a single man within my age range, but I often find myself attracted to men in their late 30s to early 40s. I don't intend for this to happen. I met a man at a bookstore recently, and we went on a lovely date. When we realized the age gap was more than 12 years, we mutually decided not to pursue a relationship and remained friends. This pattern has repeated itself with different men. And yet I find, when I try to date men my own age, they're unavailable. Either they have partners or they can't keep up with me in terms of emotional maturity. Would it be a waste of my youth to experiment with older men? I'm an independent woman with financial stability who is still discovering her voice in many ways. I'm scared that dating an older man would interfere with this process of self-discovery because they've already found their voice, or at least are more settled in a version of who they are. I'm concerned about what effect such a power dynamic will have on me. Another fear I have about dating an older man is if it worked out, I'd have to face the possibility of living the last 20 years of my life alone. I'm not looking for someone to parent or financially support me. I'm looking for a partner. Am I making a mistake by not exploring a May-December relationship? Signed, May-December Curious. Mm -hmm. Sort of hits on some of those things yeah. you were concerned about when you first met Aaron. Uh, this idea that you know, getting in a relationship with an older man, somebody who's further down the path in terms of emotional maturity and life experiences, you're, you know, that she'd be missing out on something. Yeah, that you become a kind of adjunct, you know, an adjunct partner in, in the relationship. I mean, you know, we talk about age, but it's really in relationships, it's power is what she's talking about. The power to create your own identity and to be recognized fully for that versus sort of, you know, hooking your, your, your wagon to somebody else's route. And I thought about a couple of pieces of literature as I was reading this. Weirdly enough, our oldest daughter, um, Josie, is now, we just finished reading Little Women. And it's such a fascinating story. Jo is the writer in the family, and she has an appropriate partner, the neighbor Lori, who's her age and is in love with her. And she still decides, Jo decides, that she doesn't love Lori. And who she winds up with is Professor Beer. And Professor Bear is, if you remember from the film with Winona Ryder, is beautiful Gabriel Byrne. But actually in the book, Cheryl, he's not attractive. Mm. He's twice her age. He's 40 years old. And he doesn't have money. And he's a German immigrant. There are a lot of things in the traditional narrative that say, don't head for this guy. But what does he have in Little Women? He knows that she's a writer. And he knows that he wants to help her find her voice. So in a certain way, he's exactly what she needs, and the ages be damned. Now, on the other side of that, and, and I think really May, December, Curious, what you said is that I, I need to find my voice. Whatever man is, is, is on board with that program and recognizes that that's part of his job in the relationship is to help you find your voice, don't be looking at the demographic chart. It doesn't matter whether they're 50 or 25. Those are the words that you need to hear, that I get that you are figuring out who you are, and I want to help foster that. Yeah. Yeah, and that's the, the advice I have to give, May to Sever Curious, is rooted in that exactly, that you can't make decisions about people when you're thinking them about them as categories yes. rather than individuals. Yes. And so the first thing I would say to you, May December Curious, is I think that you should date people you like. I think you should date people who you find interesting and attractive and compelling, no matter what their age is. I mean, obviously within legal limits. But, you know, if you're meeting a guy who's, you know, 12 years older than you or 10 years older than you, that sounds like that's sort of the age range you're finding. I think that's perfectly fine. Now, there are all kinds of people who are 12 years older than you. Right? right. And some of them are really settled in their lives and they've had all of these experiences and uh, they're not very generous and they're going to resent you for going and having all of your experiences. And some of those people are going to be actually still finding themselves, finding their own voices. Right. OK. And so you don't know this yet until you actually are asking questions about 
that specific person. The other thing I just want to point out, this line you say, and I'm afraid if it worked out, I'd have to face the possibility of living the last 20 years of my life alone. Mm -hmm. Well, you know, that presumes that your life is going to go along this course that that, that you get to control. You you actually don't know uh, when you will die. You don't know when your future partner will die. You don't know what sort of health you're going to be in. You know, all of us know anything could happen at any minute. Right. And so, you know, you don't want to sort of over predict your life, May, December, Curious. So my recommendation to you pretty strongly is just go out there and, and connect with people who spark your, your sense of, uh, you know, attraction and desire and adventure and all of those good things that we look for when we're looking for a partner. And those questions that you're asking are really questions to be asked within the context of a specific relationship. But it's, there's a tragic underside to it because once you get serious about somebody, then you do have to factor in a real concern. If somebody is 20 years older than you, and, you know, as we'll hear in our next letter, um, they're in a different place health-wise than you are and, you know, in terms of parenting. Those are real issues. They're not to be ignored. But there are lots of things that we weigh when we fall in love and decide to partner with somebody. And mm-hmm. age is not, you know, you can't go through life with a with a strict set of boxes. You There has to be, the biggest box has to be, is this person going to help me tell the story of my life? And, are, you, you know, that's that's at the center of it. I think we should uh, get in touch with our guest for this episode, who I'm very excited to talk with. Yes, Lucinda Franks. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Well, let me tell you a little bit about her, and then we'll we'll ring her up on the old telephone. Uh, she is a Pulitzer Prize-winning reporter, former staff writer for the New York Times, and she's written a couple of memoirs, fascinating memoirs. One was about her father, a mysterious uh, figure to her, fighter pilot. But we're going to talk with her more about her second memoir, which is called Timeless, Love, Morgan Thau, and Me, which was published last year. And she's writing about her romance with and marriage to a man who's 27 years older than her, Robert Morgenthau, a famous district attorney for the, for New York County in the borough of Manhattan, and Lucinda is now, I think she's 69 or 70, and Morgenthau, is, her husband, is 96. So yeah, wow. it's about 27 years. So uh, let's call her up. All right. Hello? Hi, is this Lucinda Franks? Yes, it is. Hi, this is Cheryl Strayed from Dear Sugar Radio. Hi, Cheryl. How are you? I'm great. Thanks so much for taking the time to talk with us. I'm here with I'm here with Steve Almond. Hi, Lucinda. Hi. So, Lucinda, we understand your husband. He's 27 years older. Is that correct? That's correct. So, tell me, actually, a little more, a little more than that. Okay, so 27 and a half. That's that's that half is important. So, tell (laughs) us, how did you meet, and how did you come to fall in love with somebody who is a gener, you know, a generation older than you? Well, I certainly hadn't planned to do this. Um, My dreams had always been a person my own age and uh, with my own interests. But I was a journalist for the New York Times, and I was in my mid-20s. I interviewed the district attorney of New York, Robert Morgenthau. I was sort of struck by his features that were very unusual, very large forehead, which, of course, spoke about his large brain. Just very cute, uh, cute mouth. <laughs> you know what they say, um, large forehead, large brain. I've that's heard right. that. Yes, right. I right. always wondered about my own big forehead. I didn't know that that was, it meant well, I was, yeah. Well, for you, you must be very brainy. <laughs> right. So, in any case, that was a hippie. And he was an icon of the establishment, although a liberal Democrat. And I was wearing a, I guess it was a hippie poncho to the interview. And he couldn't get that what he called, later called a rug that I was wearing, <laughs> out, out of his mind. He uh, wondered what was underneath that rug. <laughs> well, I, all right, moving on. Right. Uh, uh, we, um, one night, he asked me on a date. I thought he wanted to sell me a story, but he had other ideas. He asked me to a party at Arthur Schlesinger's house on behalf of Jimmy Carter, who was running for president and leading in the polls. Hmm. So I dressed up in my best silk peasant blouse, (laughs) my bell bottoms, and my uh, platform shoes, 
and Bob didn't seem to blink at all, and we walked into the Schlesinger home, and there was this glass of women in silk and satin, and I was just freaked out. They, <laughs> hey, just, they thought, you weren't wearing the, the poncho. Is, I mean, it could have been worse. No, 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 no. <laughs> No, but it was the high society women of right. New York, the right. highest. Right. Yeah. How old were you at this time? I was in my mid twenties. So Holy you're in your mid twenties, and you're going on a date with a guy who's almost fifty at this point, or right. is he fifty? Yeah. Well, he's. I think he was about fifty three. Wow. Dang. So I, they looked at me like I was homeless, and I turned around and I started to walk out the door. And I walked right into Jackie Kennedy Onassis. And they just looked at Jackie like she was a god. They Their jaws dropped, and they couldn't stop smiling. And I looked up at Bob, and he was smiling, too, but not at Jackie. Aww. Aww. <laughs> but it, uh, so that's so the sweet. The rest is history. You know that feeling that just goes right down you of, oh, my God. <laughs> That you were I falling didn't in realize love. I felt like this. Yeah, I didn't, and I had no idea that he was just a news source to me, and certainly not a candidate for dating. So then, when you did fall in love, and you did have that feeling of like, okay, he's the one. Did you have concerns about the about that age difference? Absolutely, from the beginning, and I mean, we fell in love that very first night, and we remained in love and you know uh you can't do anything about falling in love you cannot fight it it will always win but i was very concerned about all the things that the people that wrote you letters were concerned about you know his longevity you know would he be able to have the energy to be a father to do the things i did would he actually get to know my my hippie law-breaking friends and you know would he accept them right i was just there was so much that spoke against my marrying him uh and he did have five uh children by his previous marriage his wife had died five years before and a suburban house of all things Uh, there was every reason in the book for me not to marry him yeah and how did that i mean now this was many many years ago how long have you been together now well, it's been about 38 years. 38 years. Okay. Obviously, you, the two of you have had a long and happy love. But but were there things that, that, did you, that you turned out to be like, okay, th- this was actually pretty hard right. because of the age difference? What, what, what were some of the challenges? You know, I don't think there were much of any challenges until, you know, he got to be uh, in his 90s. And he... Predictably, as anybody would, slow down a bit. You know, we don't go hiking and do or camping or do some of the things we we did before. But we've we've learned to how to, you know, to replace those with conversation. And you know, we we travel, and it's it's been okay. And and I never never thought he would live this long. Mm-hmm. I always, from day one lived in fear that he was going to die. Yeah. Right. And of course he didn't. Hmm. Right. But I am curious, Lucinda, what about having children mothering a, a child or children? Was that something you wanted, something you felt you had to give up, or was it was the life you no, found? No, no, I wanted it. I wanted, I mean, I wanted my own children. Yeah. And I wa- certainly wanted to be a good friend to his children. And he was a terrific father. He would come in the door and he would start singing, give my regards to Broadway. And, <laughs> and it just rejuvenated him. He, he found the energy, you know, to be a father. And I think a second time father, as it's almost common uh, wisdom now, that they appreciate their kids more because they have established themselves. Yeah. And right. they have more time. I think that sometimes youth is is overrated, frankly, when it comes to this idea of of energy and you know, like I don't, I I became a mother in my mid to late thirties, and and you know, I don't think I would have been a better mom if I'd had kids at twenty two. 
you know, you're bringing a different kind of wisdom. So I think that that's really important for May, December curious we're, when we're addressing her, her concerns. Right. Lucinda, should I avoid dating people who are, you know, 10 or so years older than me because, because of these things? Really, I think your whole story has answered her question about that. You know, you're just like, go for it. Right. Oh, oh I, I do. Because there are two things that I kind of live by. And one is, if you want to make God laugh, tell him your plans. Right. Yes. Nobody knows who or why or what is going to happen. You know, your 22-year-old husband could have a catastrophic accident or illness at any age. Your older husband could, like mine is, live, you know, well into his 90s and, and, and more. Also, there is nothing constant but change. There was something new all the time that kept the marriage alive. And if it got stale, we found ways to reinvent it. We found ways to see and appreciate each other as the young, beautiful people we fell in love with. Because sometimes, you know, you lose sight of that wonderful person you fell in love with as you age. Hmm. That's beautiful. You know, that's really beautiful, Lucinda. Thank you for sharing that with us. Everything you said, actually, applies to every couple at any age, you know, whether you're born on the same day or or 20 years apart. I think that those values that that you reminded us of, that change is constant, that that we're always having to expect the unexpected and learn how to love through that is really powerfully true. Yeah. Well, thank you for saying that. Oh, thank you. Last Scene, a new podcast from WBUR in the Boston Globe, investigates the largest unsolved art heist in history. So about the time that he begins putting the duct tape on, he says, this is a robbery. The theft of half a billion dollars worth of art from the Isabella Stewart Gardner Museum in Boston. When the FBI says, we solved it, we know who did it, it's like, no, you don't, because you don't have the paintings. Subscribe and listen to Last Scene now on Apple Podcasts or wherever you get your podcasts. Sponsored by Samuel Adams and ADT Smart Home. All right, so we're going to uh, continue this conversation, but with a, a new letter, a different iteration of the same set of questions. Okay, Steve, read the letter. Dear Sugars, I'm a 30-year-old woman, and I think I've met the love of my life. She is everything I have ever wanted in a partner, kind, playful, loving, genuine, and sensitive. Over the past six months, we have fostered a deep and trusting bond. For the first time in my life, I feel completely safe and grounded in who I am. We've started dreaming together about home ownership, marriage, and children. I am proud to be hers, and I am lucky to be falling in love with her. Here's the thing. There's an age gap. Sixteen years, to be exact. She's 46 and well into her middle age, with a whole lifetime of experiences under her belt. Our souls seem to match up, and in many ways this gap is undetectable. But as I look down the road, questions and doubts emerge. I am in my reproductive prime and eager to have a baby. She wants children too, but she will be in her mid-sixties with a teenager. Our careers and our separate friend groups are in distinctly different life stages. I still feel young and healthy. She has health issues that slow her down and could become serious down the road. Many of my friends are still single and dating. They warn me that this older woman will keep me from excitement. Am I going to regret committing to someone who is so much my senior, especially if the age gap becomes more distinct over time? Am I making a mistake by thinking she would be a good co-parent? Am I going to be missing out in some way by not moving through life's milestones with one of my peers? Sugars, I'm a realist. I know I'm still in that honeymoon phase of a new relationship where the dreaming comes easy. I'm patient. I know a little more time with her will reveal more answers. But I also feel a great responsibility to not hurt her later if I'm having doubts now. Should I trust my gut here and stay where I am? Or should I think again and look for someone my own age, with hope, minding the gap? Hmm. What do you think, Lucinda? I, I think her concerns are real, and and sh- she may be giving up some of that excitement with her peers, but 
everybody who has an unconventional uh, marriage in the works, they have all sorts of doubts. And, of course, they have to go through those doubts and think about them and talk about them with the other person and work through it. I mean, Bob and I, you know, as, as I put forth in, in my book, Timeless, it, it was timeless. And we were delighted, actually, in each other. I was delighted in the wisdom he had at his stage of life, at, say, the 50s, 60s. And he was delighted by my youth and my energy. You know, one of the parts of Timeless that's very moving, Lucinda, is um, a, a passage you know, towards the end where you uh, talk about a, a conversation you had with your husband and he says, you know, basically, I think you're angry at me because I got old. Well, it, it is difficult because you don't want to lose them. Right. When Bob entered his 90s, I, I, I have had envy and, and um, nostalgia looking at people that were the same age. And every blow up in the walking gate You know, every difficulty in picking something up or doing something for themselves that you have to to then do is, is, is painful. But, you know, I have to keep saying to myself, what would have been the alternative? I am very, very, very blessed that Bob has lived this long because I am still in love with him in spite of, you know, all the differences we now have in, in our age and in our capacity to do things. And when you're really in love with somebody, as it sounds like minding the gap is, then you found the treasure of your destiny and you do everything to hold on to that. Yeah. You never know what's coming. That's right. Well, and as we've noted, people are afraid of doing this or that or the other thing when it comes to love because we want to control our romantic destinies. We want to say like, I want to find that perfect person and live happily ever after. We want the fairy tale. And the deal is, is that, you know, the, the, the best version of the fairy tale we can possibly get, I think, is the one that you've spoken so eloquently about today, Lucinda. And that is finding somebody you love who really loves you back. Yep. So thank you, Lucinda. You, you've you given us such insight and wisdom. And thank you so much for sharing your story and helping us answer these letters today. Well, thank you. I, I, it was a pleasure. Bye, Lucinda. Okay, bye-bye. Fascinating to have that moment that, you know, Lucinda is this young woman in her mid-20s. She's in her peasant blouse. She's, you know, <laughs> a radical. And she, here she is escorted by her, you know, much older, more than twice as old as her powerful New York scion, into this party with all these elegant pairs, and there's Jackie O, but, you know, Morgenthau is looking at her. Mm-hmm. And that's that's what everybody's looking for, is yeah. the person who is looking at them. They're the Jackie O of, of, of their particular world. But I'm sympathetic to both Minding the Gap and, and May, December Curious, because I think their anxieties about these questions are really about di- a different set of anxieties. It's taking the form of age. But May, December Curious is saying, am I going to have volition and power to shape my own story? And what she, what she hope, hopefully will realize is a good partner of whatever age is going to help you author that story, is going to act like Professor Beer and Little Women, and is going to say, I, I know who you are. I think I know what you're, who you're trying to be, and I want to help you become that person. And for minding the gap, I don't think you can live a life where you're constantly sort of plagued by the ghost ship of regret. You know, you cannot live. What you're putting aside in that equation is everything that you've told us about this woman who you're so in love with. And for the first time, you feel safe and you feel truly loved and regarded. And are you going to throw that away because of some hypothetical? Yeah. Well, and and I think both the letter writers, uh, both the letters we discussed today, there is this struggle, you know, less really with the technical age gap, but rather the narrative right. that they've absorbed exactly. all of their lives, which is, you know, generally that you're meant to find love with somebody who's about your age, you know, and you noted that moment when they're at the party and, and everyone's looking at Jackie O and, and Bob is looking at Lucinda, and which is a wonderful story. But I have to say by far, 
the more moving love story for me is the fact that here she is all of these years later, so many years later, saying, I'm still in love with him. Right. That's what this is really about. That's what that love story is really about. That's right. Everyone can have a hot moment on a first date at a party. Yes, that's um, right. Not everyone can can go, you know, 30 go distance. years later and say, I love him still. Right. Or th- more than 30. I mean, I'm not doing the math right here. I was an English major. <laughs> a long time. Yeah. A long time. So, Minding the Gap and made December curious. We wish you the best in your uh, your journey, your love journeys. And we hope that uh, you'll make that leap and rewrite those stories and find love wherever you find it, where it feels good, where it feels compelling, where it feels right. Go for it. Yes. Dear Sugar Radio is produced by WBUR. We are produced and edited by the wonderful and amazing Lisa Tobin, who just informed me that she has what she called an age-appropriate boyfriend. <laughs> We're recording in Portland, Oregon. Our engineer is Josh Millman of Talkback Sound and Visual. Our theme music is by the Portland band Wonderly. Please listen and subscribe on iTunes. And if you like the show, please leave an iTunes review. Please, don't leave mean reviews. I know. We can't bear that. I know. Kids, we're just delicate flowers. Don't do it. But do write to us at DearSugarRadio at gmail.com. Whether you are May, December, June, August, any month, really, write to us. 